I want to take you to another uh, insight into another individual in Scripture. This one is not John. This one happens to be the half-brother of Jesus in the flesh. Now, there's a sect of Christianity that said that Joseph and Mary had no more children. Well, what do you mean had no more children? Joseph wasn't Jesus' father to begin with. So Mary didn't have any more children. But that's not true. There were many children. In fact, one of the scriptures, if you, go, if you could find it, would somebody find this scripture for me that have all these electronic uh, accessories about Jesus' brethren that would um, laugh at him and, and, uh, and they would tell him to go up. It's almost Passover time. Jesus, you need to go up and do your thing, do your stuff. Jesus was scorned by his half-brothers and half-sisters because Joseph and Mary had additional children, contrary to Catholic dogma. Can somebody find that? Then I want to go talk about one of these half-brothers. Are you all with me? Good. Welcome. We're doing continuing education. Did you find it? I want to help me out. John 7. Let's go look quickly. John 7. John 7. That would be Jesus' best friend, John. Oh, John 7 where? Did you give me a, a verse or something? Or Around 3. Okay, this is it. Very good. Thank you so much. This is excellent. We're in that. <laughs> Here we are. Here's what John says. After these things, verse 1, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, Take that word Jewry and just mark that down. It's not what I want to talk about this morning, but the word Jewry is, is not jewelry, but Jewry. I don't know if you know this, but the word Jew is a nickname. Did you know that? They were never known as Jews by God. Men gave them the name. Jews, or Jewry would be those that would be Jews that would be known as Jews today. But who are the, now let's just have a little continuing education. Who are the Jews? Getting past the nickname, getting past the vernacular, who are these people? No, they weren't Hebrew first. They were who? They were Israelites. Why were they Israelites? Who got his name changed? I'm hearing voices. Who got his name changed? Jacob got his name changed? Okay, are you sure? All right. So then they became known as the Israelites. But before they were the Israelites, who were they? Who were they before they were the Israelites? They were the Hebrew children. Hebrew, say Hebrew. The word Hebrew is synonymous with the word Chaldean. If you look at the Hebrew language, it's also known as the Chaldean language. What does it mean by the Hebrew or the Chaldean language, and where did these people live, and where did they come from, and where did Abraham come from? Since he was a Hebrew. The word Hebrew, literally broken down, means descendants of Eber who settled on the other side of the river. Now, Eber was one of the descendants of Noah. And his descendants settled on the other side of the river. What river? The Euphrates. West Bank. Modern day Iraq. West Bank. In the city of what? Ur. You are. These people were pagans. 
These people were, Abr Abram was a pagan, lived in a pagan nation until he had an encounter with this God who called him. He happened also to be the seed of Shem, which we can track down the seed of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And we won't get into genealogies. They were soothsayers. They worshipped the sun, moon, and stars. They were astrologers. Pagans. And out of this mess, out of the seed of Shem, God chose one man to be the father of fear. The father of what? Come on, I gotta make sure you're awake. The father of faith. And when you look at the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew versus Luke 3, Matthew 1 is the genealogy of Jesus according to promise, and it begins with Abram or Abraham. It doesn't begin with Adam. But when you look at the genealogy of Jesus through his mother Mary and her father Heli, H-H-E-L-I, in Luke 3, it takes you back all the way to Abraham and then on back to Adam, son of God. This is Luke 3. So the genealogy of Jesus, first of promise from Abraham, and then of the flesh, Adam, is clearly stated. Now, why am I here in this conversation? Because we're back over here looking at the genealogy of Jesus and and you know, people don't really realize this but in the genealogies that you find in Matthew and Luke I don't know if you're aware of this but the the kingly line from David all the way through was cursed in the days of Jeconiah now that was 600 BC. You can go back to Christ. We're in AD now, after Christ. Before that, 600 BC, before Christ. 600 years before Christ, we, we, we have this journey of genealogy but then Kaniah or Jeconiah, as his name was, was not a good king. He was an evil king. And it was an evil nation. And the prophet came to this king and brought him a prophecy of judgment. God was going to judge the people because of the sin. The king laughed. There was, must have been a cold day in Israel because they had a fire going. And he took the scroll of which the prophet had written this thing for God, and he cursed and he threw it in the fire and it burned up. The prophet came right back with the same thing on another scroll. Gave it to him again. He cursed again, threw it in the fire, burned it up. Then the prophet spoke and said, not one human seed of David, Adam, will sit as king on this throne again. It was in this time period that Nebuchadnezzar came. And you had the taking away of Israel into captivity, into Babylon for 70 years. Are you tracking with me? Kaniah or Jeconiah went with him. Now, while they were in captivity, Kaniah or Jeconiah, and Kaniah, or Jeconiah, was the last sitting king of Israel. Last sitting king. Had a son. In captivity. His name was Southiel. Then so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, and begat so-and-so of the kingly line. And if you look at, if you look at this genealogy, and you can find this in Matthew chapter 1. Now, I just want to throw you a curveball. Guess 
who would have been king over Israel when Jesus was born? Joseph the carpenter. Does that surprise you? Joseph the carpenter was, if the line hadn't been cursed, he would have been the sitting king of Israel. Now, Jesus was not the son of Joseph. And Jesus could not have sat as king on the throne as son of Joseph because God had, had cursed that kingly line with Jeconiah. So there had to be a man, another man come that wasn't part of that line, wasn't the seed of Adam by promise or by God, but this one had to come from God, and this one came, the living word became flesh, he became incarnate in the womb of Mary, and you know him today as Jesus. The living word who became flesh, son of God, say son of God. So this son of God is the final sitting king of Israel that will sit in millennium. And you will serve him as kings and priests. This is the king. King of kings. Lord of lords. God of gods. This is he. Now, Jesus was not the son of Joseph, but he was, Mary was his biological mother. Tracking. Now, let's go back over here. I had to go through all this just to get back to here. The word jewelry, again, is a nickname. Isn't it amazing today that the nation of Israel is not called the nation of Jewry? The nation of Israel today is not called the nation of the Jew of Jews. What is the nation of Israel called? Isn't that amazing? So what it is called today as a nation is what it was, those people were called from the beginning many, many thousands of years ago. So let's just get this really straight that we're not dealing with just a people called the Jews. We're, calling, we're, we're dealing with the biological seed of Abraham of promise. Now, they were not grateful for their calling. When it says Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not, it doesn't mean he came to the Jews because he was a Jew. But for him to be a Jew, his father would have to be a Jew. But Jesus' his father is not a Jew. Now, think with me now. I want you to think. Are you all staring at me now? I said, Jesus' his father was not a Jew. Jesus' his father was God the Father. And God the Father is not a Jew. He's the father of all spirits. Now, Jesus is the God of Israel. He is the God of the Old Testament. He is the Lord God of the Holy Prophets. He is, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he is the one that came out of Egypt with them in the cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. The rock was Christ. Read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 16. That member of the Godhead that was with Moses, the giver of the law in Sinai, the one they templed the golden calf, the one that was in the pillar of fire by night, cloud by day. The apostle Paul identified that member of the Godhead as Christ the rock. Read it. Most Christianity doesn't even understand it. Why not? Don't, don't read their Bibles. Have you read 1 Corinthians 10 lately? Verses 1 through 16? It's a good time to read it. So rather than say, where's he coming from? Read what Paul said. Then you know where I'm coming from. Because I didn't write the Bible. Say, Pastor Wright did not write the Bible. This is not coming out of the book of Henry. This is coming out of the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Are we okay on that? Now, the reason I have one here is because I, I want to, I'm trying to introduce you to the half-brother of Jesus. Here in John, it says, I'm in, I'm in uh, St. John chapter uh, 7. Now, the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. 
His brethren therefore said unto him, his brethren. Now here we get into the debate in theological debate in Christianity that this meant other believers. Uh, let me tell you something. Their salvation had not come then. Salvation didn't begin until he died for your sins. There were no believers to be called brethren when Jesus began to grow up as a young man. It was just Judaism. The Old Testament church. They weren't known as brethren. Brethren is a vernacular that is peculiar to the new birth. It's something that came along with becoming this new man. One new man. This new creature. This born again spirit being that God joined by his spirit. So this obviously is not faith brethren. This is biological brethren in the time that this is being written about. There was no church pre-resurrection. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go unto Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you do. What they're doing is they're goading him. Lord, it, Jesus, isn't it time for you to go do your stuff with your disciples? For there is no man that doth anything in secret, and he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Now they're tempting him to promote himself and do his thing and say, hey, look at me. That's what they're doing. This is his other brothers of Joseph and Mary. Why do I know that these are not brethren of the New Testament church age? Read verse 5. For neither did his brethren believe in him. So it's very easy if you're a thinking person to know that the word brethren here is not a spiritual union of like-minded believers. This is biological. Because if they were brethren that were believers, they would believe in him, wouldn't they? So are you tracking? This is a little bit of deductive reasoning, but it's pretty obvious. Now, one of these brothers, now here's where I'm going, and I will not finish this today. I just want to introduce a new subject. I want to introduce you to one of the half-brothers of Jesus, the man. Jesus the man. Say, Jesus the man. Son of God. I want to introduce you to one of his half-brothers. I want to take you over past the writings of Paul. And I want to take you, and most of the New Testament is, a lot of it is the writings of Paul. But I want to take you over past Hebrews, and I want to take you over to the book of James. Now, there's a number of James, men by the name of James, in, in Scripture. So you kind of have to say, well, who's who? And uh, there's the son of Zebedee. This is not that one. There's the son of this one. It wasn't that one. This one happens to be one of those brothers that was a scorner early on. This is one of his biological half-brothers that joined and became a believer and became an author of one of your books of the Bible. There's a great movement in America to remove this book from your Bible. There's another movement to remove the book of Hebrews from your Bible. And it's not just a small one. If you take out the book of Hebrews and you take out the book of James, there's nobody being held responsible for anything anymore. Do what you want. Because Hebrews and James drops the plumb line of God's concern for his people and authenticates the greatness of Jesus himself, the man.
A lot of people don't like to think of Jesus being a human. Well, we, want, we spent some time with, with uh, his best friend John earlier here that he existed before he became a human. And the word Jesus is derivative out of the Greek. You know that, don't you? Uh, if we were to, um, you know, move it over, we might say Yeshua. And there are people that won't say Jesus, they say Yeshua. If you were to take, if you were to take um, his name in Hebrew into English, if you were to take the word Yeshua in Hebrew, do you know what the literal translation from Hebrew to English of Yeshua is? Joshua. If you go to the book of Joshua found in your Bible and look up the word in the Hebrew, it's Yeshua. So why don't we call Jesus Joshua? Because the New Testament wasn't written in Hebrew, it was written in Greek. Now I'm not trying to be divisive, we're just having a, we're just having a conversation. Uh, we call him Jesus, some people won't. We call him Yeshua, then call him Joshua. Don't make me speak Hebrew if I don't know how. If you're going to force me to speak Hebrew over one name, then force me to speak Hebrew on all the word. And it becomes a debate becomes an argument over names. I know who Jesus is. He's the living word. The second member of the eternal Godhead that came in the flesh and became one of us. The Bible says any spirit that does not confess that Jesus became, came literally in the flesh and became one of us is spirit of antichrist. He divested himself of the glory that we had with the Father he lowered himself beneath the angels, and he literally became a human. I don't understand it either. But it happened. So I receive it. I don't argue the point. I say thank you. That the words of the prophet Isaiah could be fulfilled in Isaiah 7.14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Jesus' best friend in John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, became one of us. Do not take on the appearance of flesh, as one of your Christian songs is trying to teach you. As his Freemasonry says that Christ did not come in the flesh, in the Prince of Mercy degree, but simply took on the appearance of flesh to accommodate himself to the language of the Jews. That's right in Freemasonry. But the Bible says any spirit that does not confess that Christ literally became one of us, a man dying for a man, is spirit of Antichrist. It's a paradox, isn't it? It's hard to understand in the natural, but who asked you to be natural? You want to bring God down to your level? Would you like to come up to God's level? I want to come up and understand things at God's level, not bring him down and humanize him. I know who Jesus is. Oh, I absolutely do. He is Yahweh Elohim. Exactly who he is. He is the Lord God. Jehovah Elohim. Oh, I know exactly who he is. Jesus. Joshua. Yeshua. Take your pick. I know who he is. It isn't the name. Do you know who he is? He is the Lord. And it is by his name that even devil, devils tremble. Somebody said, well, I don't believe you should use the name of Jesus because it's a Greek derivative. I have to tell you something. I've been in ministry for almost 40 years. I've cast devils out in the name of Jesus, and they've obeyed me so much for that. I've ministered healing and deliverance and creative miracles in the name of Jesus, and the Father has honored it, and it has happened. So I'm content to use that name. Spare me the argument. Here in James, as I draw this down into focus, this book here is by this half-brother. 
When you get into the book of James, and I'm going to get into the book of James, but not today, because I've already spent too much time talking about this. But in this fellowship here, Hope of the Generations, in our continuing education, I'm going to spend some time going chapter to chapter, verse to verse, to let you hear the heart of this brother of Jesus, half-brother, that used to be a scorner of Jesus, used to be a troublemaker and laugh at him, became a follower. What happened to this man? I think there's something to be learned by his writings. Just as we read about the writings of Jesus' best friend in John, and in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And how about the book of Revelation? I think there's something to be learned by the witnesses of that day. I wasn't there, but they were. So I want to know the heart and the mind of those witnesses that lived in that time, lived in that setting, walked, saw him, broke bread with him, heard his teachings, and yes, in the case of James, even was a troublemaker about it, then became converted. I want to learn from these men. And I want to help this church learn from what they learned, that our faith may join them. Why? Because your faith that you have today is also built on the foundation and the faith of the apostles. So if that is the case, let's go back and find out what their faith was as eyewitnesses to this incredible love of the Father for mankind. And let's learn from their words, learn from their writings, and let's embrace it, not argue with it. And could we say, yea, amen, to what they write, not ya, yeah, but? And could we do that? That'll take us to our next teaching. God bless you.